or you're told that you need to be respectful. So don't talk back to your teacher. Always do what the policeman says. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but these are the messages, right? And so they get ingrained in us that my boss is always right, or I have to always be polite. And, you know, how do I disagree? You know, how can I say I'm not feeling great about this? Hi, everyone. This is Tim Clark. I'm here with another episode of Culture by Design, and I have with me this week Ed Everts, who is the founder and president of Excellius Leadership Development, a leadership development organization focused on helping clients build their self-awareness on how others experience them in the workplace so they can manage that experience effectively. Ed is the author of Drive Your Career, nine high impact ways to take responsibility for your own success and also raise your visibility and value uncover the lost art of connecting on the job and he's also a host of a weekly podcast be brave at work and ed invited me to be a host on his podcast a while back and i have to return the favor for two reasons number one i had a great experience and I really appreciated that. Number two, we need to go deep into what Ed has been digging into and spending his time with, the bravery at work, which is such an important part of creating a healthy, vibrant, strong culture. And so, Ed, welcome to the podcast. So excited that you can be here. I am thrilled to be here with you today, Tim. Thank you for allowing me to join. Let's go back and tell us a little bit about your story. So where did you grow up? And give us a little thumbnail sketch of your life. I was born in Queens, New York, and I lived there until I was about seven or eight. And then we moved to a couple of East Coast New York State cities, Pleasant Valley and Poughkeepsie. And we lived there for about four years. And one of my few childhood memories I can recall is the night my father came home and asked us all to come into the living room. I had four brothers and sisters, there were five of us and my mother. And he said, we're gonna be moving. We're gonna move to Fort Smith, Arkansas. No kidding. Yeah, no, I'm not kidding. That's a different world, right? For a bunch of New Yorkers, uh, <laughs> I, I don't think myself and my little sister had even heard of Arkansas. So we packed up our bags and in those days you drove and we drove from Poughkeepsie to Fort Smith, Arkansas. I went to junior high, high school and college in Arkansas. I will tell you, it was a fantastic place to grow up, completely different lifestyle than New York City, as you can imagine. And we could also talk about that for hours, but it was a much, much different experience. And my father was in retailing, my mother was in retailing. He moved and moved us in order to work at a retailer in Fort Smith. And when I graduated college, I too went into retailing, as oftentimes happens. And I spent about 15 years in retailing for the years in Arkansas and Tennessee. And then I made a significant life decision to pack up my bags and move to Boston and came up here in the early 80s and stayed here for the remainder of my career. I worked in retailing for about 15 years and then worked at a business to business company called Iron Mountain for another 10 years and then left Iron Mountain in 2008 to transition to my own independent practice, doing the work that I'm doing today. So you've been doing your own practice for how long now? It's 14 years, it's now- 14 years, wow. It's now my longest employment experience. So what possessed you to make that change, to leave retail and hang a shingle and try and do this? I shouldn't say try, but do it very successfully. How did you come to that conclusion? Well, when I left Iron Mountain and I was laid off from Iron Mountain, I was in human resources and the organization had gone through significant restructuring over the past three to four years. And island I was on kept getting smaller and smaller. So I knew at some point this conversation might happen. I didn't expect it the day it happened, but it did. And it happened on June 1st, which of course is the best day of any year to be left uh, released from work because spring and summer is just starting. So <laughs> that's right. You know, if it had happened in November or December, it would have been a lot more depressing. And I uh, took some time to think about what I wanted to do next. And candidly, Tim, I 
felt, although we did a lot of work at Iron Mountain and a lot of great work, I felt under accomplished. I just didn't feel like I had done things that were meaningful and long lasting. They were short term projects. And two years later, we would have forgotten about them. And, you know, I said, you know, at this stage in my career and at this point, I was in my mid 40s. You know, I want to do something that I can be proud of and that I feel can provide value and impact to people. And so I made a decision that summer after networking with a lot of people in the coaching industry to transition to my own independent practice doing uh, what I do today, three things, one-on-one leadership coaching, team coaching and facilitation, and business strategy. So, you know, for me, I think it was the time of life, the feeling I had leaving corporate America, and my desire to do something significantly different. When you made that change, Ed, did you know exactly what areas you wanted to focus on? I knew that I wanted to do something in the coaching arena. And interestingly, you don't know how much people like you until you're leaving a company, because that's when they all come out of the woodwork and say, I can't believe you're leaving. You helped me so much. You know, what are you doing? Why are you doing it right? And I'm like, where were you people all this time? Yeah. Why didn't you tell me that before? <laughs> that's right. Right. I would have benefited. Yeah. But the colleagues that came forward, most of them were coaching conversations about their career or a challenge they were having with a boss or a colleague. And these were deeper, more meaningful conversations. And I knew I didn't want to do recruitment and I knew I didn't want to do comp and benefits. And coaching became a natural indicator for me of where I wanted to spend my time and energy. I had not had any coach training. I didn't consider myself a coach. So I was starting from the first floor. I had to build my coaching practice. I had to build my coaching skill set. I had to find clients, right? It was all starting from zero. And Coaching clearly was the right choice for me on a variety of levels, but it was really an indicator from when I left Iron Mountain, a message from others about where I should spend my time. Well, you must have had some indication, though, Ed, that you were good at this, some kind of feedback that said, I've got some aptitude here. I've, I have some motivation. I have some passion, right? Yeah, it, yes. And reflection at my career, the times that meant the most to me and of the feedback I got from people once they knew I was leaving, it was around coaching conversations that they felt I was good at it, that they benefited from those conversations. That alone was significant for me, Tim, in respect to where I wanted to put my time and energy. I knew this was a huge challenge in front of me to grow from being employed to being self employed and from doing general HR work to focusing on coaching. You know, the other influencer for me was throughout my career, I was a generalist in HR, which meant I was touching everything, but only to a certain degree. And I wanted to transition to something that I could go deep into and just one thing, not 30 things, but just one thing. And so I went from a career where I was doing all sorts of HR activities only to a certain degree to coaching and getting as deep as I can in that. And I'm still a student of coaching today. I still learn and develop and gain insights and assets from everybody that I work with. So you've been doing this for 14 years. You've worked with a variety of organizations, clients, all kinds of people. Let's transition to this topic of bravery at work because coaching's a broad skill area. It's certainly important. You can help a lot of people, but where did you lock on to this this topic of bravery at work, how did that come about? Well, I'll answer it two ways, Tim. The first is the more technical way. So to, in the summer of 2019, I connected with a colleague of mine whom I had worked with 15 years earlier at one of those retailing organizations. And he and I had stayed in touch electronically, LinkedIn, Facebook, we hadn't seen each other. And so finally, one of us said, gee, this is so ridiculous. Let's grab a cup of coffee. So we met for a cup of coffee in the middle of 2019. And he's a communications expert. And what are you doing? What are you working on, et cetera? And he said, you know, I'm starting a podcast production company. We're not creating a podcast. We're going to market and distribute other people's podcasts. And I said something innocently naive, like, wow, I've always wanted to do a podcast. And he said, you're in, right? (laughs) Let's do it. Let's do it, right? That would be fantastic. And he said, what would you want your podcast to be about? And, you know, for reasons that only a psychoanalyst could probably uncover, I said, you know, I think I should do something about bravery at work. You know, in my experience with clients, 
And in my own experience as a business professional, bravery is something that impacts everybody all the time. You know, I haven't done a study of it, but I do know. And every time I share it with somebody, they shake their head and say, yes, I have had that experience. We all have had opportunities to be braver at work and avoided them. So he says, sounds great. You know, we want it to be a tight, specific model. You know, we want to do kind of like a 20 to 30 minute conversation. And from that point on, and likewise with coaching, I was starting from zero. I had never, ever done a podcast. I didn't have any equipment. I didn't have any marketing materials. And he said, I'll help you, right? Let's do it together and I'll help you start strong so that you can continue to do this for as long as you would like. But let's go back to this bravery. So you've tenaciously focused on this topic. Let's kind of peel it back a little bit. Why, why did you land on it? You could have done so many different things or address so many different topics. Why did you land on it, A, and B, how do you define it? So I think I landed on it for two reasons. One is based on my experience as a leadership coach and as an employee, I saw numerous examples of people needing to be brave at work and not doing it. And while I never got hired as a leadership coach to help me be braver, ultimately we talked about things that people needed to do, conversations they needed to have with certain people, typically their boss, that they've been avoiding or not doing. And it was eroding their job satisfaction and their relationship, et cetera. So I said, well, let's figure out how you can have this type of conversation. The second reason, and I'll probably uh, butcher this uh, joke, but you know, there's the old comment that psychiatrists are all crazy because they're just trying to solve their own problems. <laughs> so you know, right. when I look back on my career, you know, while I had a lot of high points and things that went really well, I loved my time at Iron Mountain. I had a great, great career there. There are moments where I was not brave and I avoided or hid from issues that I needed to handle, needed to step into. I didn't know how. I didn't think I had somebody that could help me and I avoided them or I did them and I disagreed with doing them, but I still did them anyway because I was trying to be a good soldier and thought this was something that I needed to do. So I think part of it is my own development which is looking for how I can solve this puzzle about why when we have moments where we need to be brave that we avoid it. And then secondly, because I believe so many others are experiencing the exact same situation at work, that there is a moment in time, whether it's planned, like I'm thinking about saying something to you and it's something I'm thinking about over time or in the moment, right? At that moment, I need to do or say something that we avoid and that we don't take the opportunity to very respectfully and professionally say something. So you've seen a pattern here, evidently, Ed, where people are not brave when they want to be or they or they should be, and then they regret it. Can you give us an example from your own career of a moment like that? Oh, you're going deep now. <laughs> you want me to share? Yeah, I won't use any names, but you know, a very prevalent example. And I'll simplify it. It's a little bit complicated, but we released from employment an individual at our organization due to general performance issues. And he rode off into the sunset. Two or three years later, we acquire a company into the organization and who's employed at that company, but this individual. Wow. So now he's kind of back and we're like, well, do we want him back? Should he be back, et cetera. And you know, there were a number of ways that I could have handled it, but my boss said, Ed, I need you to fly to New York and tell so-and-so that he is no longer going to be employed, that he was terminated once and that termination holds. It didn't sit incredibly well with me because I just felt like, you know, that this is something you do once, you don't do it twice. I should have reached out to a person in my organization to talk about it. I didn't. And again, Tim, I will tell you in an effort to be a good soldier, I said, okay, I'll do it. And I flew to New York and walked into the lobby of the hotel and he knew I was coming, of course, because we had scheduled the time. And he said, I, I think I know why you're here. I hope it's not why you're here, but you know, I think I know why you're here. And you know, I released him from employment again. So you know, I look back on that and this is one of the key factors that impact people, Tim, as it relates to bravery, I look back at it with regret. And regret is something that we have in our lives. And I just finished reading a great book by Daniel Pink called The Power of Regret. And, you know, he believes regret is something that makes us human 
and that there are benefits to regret, that it's not all a negative, but it's something we carry. And I'm sure you have, I'm sure everyone you know, looks back on something in their life, professionally or personally, that they wish they had done a little bit differently or said a little bit differently that could have produced a different outcome. And that's my goal, both with the podcast and in my forthcoming book in 2023 about bravery to help people minimize, not eliminate. I don't think I can eliminate your opportunities for being brave, but minimize them so you don't have as much regret as you might have today. You know, this reminds me, Ed, of, it makes me think about Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon. Well, I guess he's moved into the chairmanship now. But in 2017, he put out a letter to shareholders and he gave some leadership insights in that letter. And it's it's a pretty well-known letter. And and one, one piece of advice or one maxim that he shared was to commit to disagree and commit. So that means that we're debating issues. We are looking at decisions. We're evaluating different potential courses of action. And we have to make decisions. A decision is going to be made. And whoever has the decision-making authority is going to make that decision. Sometimes we're going to agree. Sometimes we're not. And his point is disagree. So voice your disagreement, voice your dissent, express your point of view, mount your argument, you know, marshal the evidence, whatever you need to do, do it. But if it turns out that we're still going to go in a different direction, then, okay, you've had your say, so you've disagreed, now commit. And it makes me think about what we need to do, how we need to reconcile ourselves with a course of action before we can do that in good faith, right? So I'm thinking back on the experience that you just shared, Ed. And so here we inherit this employee for a second time, and you're dispatched to uh, dismiss this employee for a second time. And you're having misgivings. You're having doubts. You're not at peace about this, right? So I'm thinking about the process that we need to go through to be brave, to get to the point where maybe we feel we're not done. We feel we haven't disagreed fully. We haven't gone through the process that we need to go, go through. So there's a way to do that, right? There's a way to be courageous and do it in a way that satisfies the, maybe the moral compunction that we have or the worry that we have, but it's also professional and we won't go forward with regrets, even if we're overruled in the end. So if you were to do that again, what would you do differently in that scenario? Well, anytime any of us, Tim, feel dismay or discomfort, we've got to share with somebody our experience and a motto I've adopted of many in my coaching career is with options, we have answers. And it's let's talk about multiple options that might be available here, because if the only option I'm hearing is, Ed, you need to go and terminate this person, we haven't talked about, well, is there a different role he or she could be in? Could we give them 90 days to see if they learned their lesson, right? I mean, there's all these variations and I didn't do that, right? I just took the mission and like in the military, you know, here's your orders and we don't want to hear any feedback from you, go off and do it. But, you know, part of the reason, Tim, for that in the research that I've done, both on the podcast and a survey on bravery is that we've not been trained how to be brave and how to navigate conflict. I could speak for many people. I think I might even speak for you that in high school and junior high school and college, you didn't take a class on how to navigate conflict or how to be braver. And yet, no, right. And then we go to high school, we go to college. And of course, then we get our first job and our first job. We're now expected to be experts in bravery and conflict navigation. And we've not learned it. We haven't even experienced it. So we're caught in this vicious circle that the behaviors we're expected to be good at professionally, we're not even learning how to do as we mature and grow up, you know, personally. Well, and then I think what even creates more dissonance, Ed, is that you're told from time to time, or you feel it internally, that you need to be brave. 
but you don't know how. Right. Or you're told that you need to be respectful. So don't talk back to your teacher. Always do what the policeman says. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but these are the messages, right? And so they get ingrained in us that my boss is always right, or I have to always be polite. And, you know, how do I disagree? You know, how can I say I'm not feeling great about this? So, you know, we don't learn these lessons as much as we learn how to be a good Boy Scout or Girl Scout or, you know, how to be a good citizen. And I'm not suggesting we shouldn't be good citizens, but we do need to disagree. I agree with Jeff Bezos. It sounds similar to the Patrick Lencioni's model around dysfunctions that you have to have conflict and you have to have conflict in order to commit. If you haven't had a conflict in order to commit, you just might be a group of yes sayers who just heard something and says, sounds good and let's just do it. Yeah. One of the things that I like to say is that the enemy is the homogenization of thought. The last thing we need is an echo chamber. Right. But again, we still keep coming back to this issue, Ed, of how do we reconcile respect on the one hand, which we're taught to do, and be respectful, and then dissent. So we have respect, we have an obligation to be respectful, but really we also have an obligation to dissent when there's merit to it, when we have a valid point of view, when we have logic and or data, even instincts, right? that tell us that we don't feel good about a decision or a course of action, we can't bury that. And I think part of what you've seen throughout your practice is that there is an empirical pattern that connects courage to better decisions. And so let's talk a little bit more about how, because I think there are probably people that are listening that are saying, okay, I'm following you so far, I agree but I'm still hung up on how. I still really, as you say, never took a class in this, don't know how to do it, but I've got some issues that are really gnawing at me and I really need to, I need to express myself. I need to deliver myself of some views that may not be popular. What do I do? How do I do it? Let's talk a little bit more about how, Ed. Sure. Well, I think, Tim, there's three things that people should think about to better position themselves to be brave. This is not something that suddenly after they listen to this podcast tomorrow, they're now the bravest person ever, right? There's some things that they need to do. The first is you need to self-ask whatever it is that's bothering you or that you think you need a better outcome on, you know, is it me? You know, what am I doing to influence this particular situation? Is it just me experiencing this? Is everyone experiencing it? Is this multiple times? Is this one time? But you need to be motivated in order to have this type of brave conversation. You don't have to be brave every moment of the day. There might be times where you say, well, it wasn't perfect, but I moved on. It wasn't one of the things I was going to pick to say something about. But when there is something that's important, you have to be motivated to make the progress that you want to make in speaking with that other person. Secondly, and this goes back to your observation about just the differences in respect to saying something, is that there needs to be a relationship. So there needs to be relationships between you and the other person. If you and I have never met and I walk up to you and say, hey, I want to give you some feedback about something that I observed a few minutes ago, I may not receive it as well as somebody whom I have a strong relationship with. So relationships is a whole nother topic but ensuring that you have positive and effective relationships with others so that you can give them positive feedback and give them constructive feedback is super critical. If you don't have those, if you're not spending time building relationships at work, it's going to be problematic for you to be brave. And then the last topic, which is aligned to the title of your podcast, is you need to be in a culture where bravery is respected, recognized, honored, rewarded, you know, this is one of the huge gaps that exists in most organizations today. We need people to be brave. We need them to do tough things, but we don't ever talk about it. It's not part of our core values. It's not part of our mission statement. We don't recognize it. We don't reward it. And this goes to your favorite topic of mine, for psychological safety and the importance of leaders to create an environment where it is okay for me to disagree, that we want you to disagree, right? You're not going to be belittled. You're not going to be judged. People aren't going to roll their eyes. It's Tim disagrees. Let's listen to him. And we listen, right? Because it's okay for you to feel a little bit different or have a little bit of different experience, to hear different things from clients or customers. These are all okay things. But until we have a culture 
that recognizes it. And maybe it's in a kind of an upside down pyramid until we have a culture that recognizes it and leaders who do it, it's not going to trickle down through the organization. And if I see leaders who aren't brave or don't think do things that they should do or don't say things they should do, I'm not going to do it either. And so you now have an unbrave organization. So I'm struck by the fact that there's a paradox here. So as I think about the factors that you just talked about, you got to be motivated sufficiently to to speak out, do something about it. You've got to have a relationship, which is an enabling condition, and you've got to have a culture that rewards that behavior sometimes, perhaps even more than sometimes. It's in an environment that does not reward that behavior in which you need to speak out the most. And so there's the irony. Mm -hmm. When the need is most acute, the conditions are not there to support you so what do you do and what do you say to people who have an important issue that they need to be brave about and yet they look around they observe they watch and they're saying ah, this is not a safe environment for me to bring this up my courage is a uh, is an act of vulnerability and that's not going to be rewarded so now what i need courage the most in the condition that rewards it the least. So that's a tough dilemma to be in, isn't it? It is, and you know, I'm reminded of one of the chapters from my book, Drive Your Career, called Play the Hand You've Been Dealt. And I'll do it in reverse order, like a poker game, a situation you're in, a work environment you're in, whatever it might be, is very much like a poker hand. And as you know, they shuffle the cards and everyone gets five cards. And one of three things happen randomly. You either have a fantastic hand, and now you could just play it, or you don't have a fantastic hand. And that's just like a situation or a workplace or relationship. It's either great or it's not so great. But regardless of what it is, you have to play the hand. And so you have really three activities you can do in reverse order. One is take action, right? And that's like turning cards in and attempting to get a better card, but you have to take action. And that requires bravery. And that might be in one of those workplaces where bravery is not acknowledged, recognized, appreciated, et cetera. And that's where you might say something like, hey, you know, I have a different thought that I'm thinking about today. I'm wondering if everybody's interested in hearing it. You know, asking for permission is such a great way to kind of break through that wall where people say, yeah, let's hear it, Ed, as opposed to just sharing it. Because if you just share it, people might reject it or get defensive immediately, right? So asking- So you're kind of asking permission almost, right? Yeah, you're asking permission to say, hey, this isn't something we do here a lot. I'm wondering if I could share an idea or uh, if I could share an observation from a customer or a client that I think we all should hear. The second thing is where most of my clients are, which is bluffing, which is pretending they have something better than they do. And a lot of my clients work in environments that don't recognize a reward or acknowledge bravery. That's just the way it is here. And they just bluff and bluff and bluff until they decide to get a new job or something happens, whatever. And then the third, which is I think highly relevant is you fold, right? Sometimes you're just not in the right environment. Sometimes it doesn't honor your culture and values. Sometimes it's not the type of place that you wanna be because of how they have created the culture. So you fold, you move on. And in today's marketplace, people fold more often than 20 years ago. I mean, 20 years ago, when you went to work at an organization, you probably stayed there forever. You know, the classic IBM sales VP who started in the mailroom, right? And worked their way up year after year after year. And 40 years later, they're now the, the senior vice president of sales. So today, people need to think about, you know, did I make a good career choice? Is this the right place I should be? And if not, either share it and take action or fold and move on to an area where you can learn from your experience and find a place that allows you to be braver. I love that. It's a great framework to use in analyzing a situation and figuring out what you need to do. Let's go back to the first point. So playing your hand. I think there are ways, and you gave an example of asking for permission, ways to play your hand, ways to ask permission and then move into expressions of bravery. I remember it wasn't too long ago, I was in a room and we were talking about some difficult issues with an executive team. And one of the executives, I'll never forget this because he did this in a way that was very endearing and it was asking permission. 
and it was also humorous. But there was a big issue that came up and he said, hey, do you mind if I arm wrestle you on that a little bit? And everybody smiled, right? But it was a beautiful segue into an act of bravery. And then he proceeded to say, you know, I've got a little different point of view and I'd like to share that with you and why. And his mode of entry, the way that he asked permission was, it was beautiful. It was elegant. It was, there was so much finesse and a genuineness to it that everybody just smiled and said, well, of course, yeah. What do you think? And it's as if everyone put down their weapons. They voluntarily disarmed. He like defanged the entire room by just saying those words. But the intent, there was this genuine intent and we knew that he was going to be showing good faith in what he was doing. He wasn't abrasive, he wasn't abrupt, and he did it in a warm and a wonderful way. And everyone listened and he was able to give very candid feedback and express his point of view. So I still remember that, Ed. Do you have any other advice on the way you do it? If you're going to play your hand, you feel that you need to play your hand, the way you do it makes a huge difference. Well, the way you do it, I think is unique to the individual who is doing it. And there are a number of ways, Tim, that you can be braver at work, but I wanna pause for a second and just acknowledge you first have to, as we said earlier, be motivated. So just because I have a clever way or interesting way of doing it, doesn't mean I'm always going to do it, right? It's not the how I do it doesn't come first, it's the what am I feeling and is this something that I want to pause everybody? Then how do I do it, right? So. You can do it with humor. You can do it with politeness. I always tell people that regardless of what you have to say, you always have to be respectful and professional, that you're not going to engage people if you're disrespectful, because that's what they'll remember. So, you know, we talked about asking permission earlier. Asking for permission is a significant way to gain people's attention and permission to share what it is that you want to say. You know, you've mentioned humor, which of course can be very, very effective. We talked about leaders who are very good at calming a group or navigating through a conversation very politely, right? It's almost like you've arrived someplace, but you didn't know you were going there because they suddenly got you there and you're like, wow, how did we get into this place? So, you know, I think people need to think about and observe as you have, you know, other styles and other ways of getting people to listen to what it is they have to say. But the more important piece isn't so much how you do it, very important, but more importantly is, you know, what point in time am I going to share a different perspective or a different viewpoint? And then how am I going to do it? Yeah. And I would imagine that person didn't always demonstrate bravery that particular way. I bet at different times, maybe they were more abrupt in other situations because of the mood or the situation. Maybe they were more urgent. You know, any good leader has, I hate to use the phrase, the proverbial toolbox of different ways to operate in different times, not just one way, right? Because one way is not going to work in every situation. You have to say, who do I need to be today? How do I want to engage this group? Okay, I'm going to use this idea and let's see if that works. No, that's excellent. Ed, what do you say to people who respond to you and say, well, I want to be brave, but the reality is if you're asking me to be brave, you're asking me to subject myself to punishment because the reality is that there's a high chance that it's not gonna go well. I feel that it's very, very important, but I might be, it may get to the point where I'm thinking, I'm gonna jeopardize my reputation, my personal standing, maybe even my career. So bravery is on a spectrum. And at the high end of the spectrum, we're talking about situations where the margin of error is low and the stakes are extremely high. And I may feel very strongly that I have an issue that I need to weigh in on. And yet I realize at the same time that the stakes are very high and the margin of error is very low. Wow, that's a tough spot to be in. I feel very pinched, but yet, so what do you say to people that find themselves in those situations? Well, I want to be clear with our listeners, Tim. I don't 
have any idea that will ever make bravery easy. Yeah. So <laughs> we all will feel a heightened level of stress anytime we're saying something to somebody that may be hard for that person to hear. It is true for me. My body temperature goes up. You know, I feel my palms sweating a little bit. I may stumble over words that I typically don't stumble, right? This is a hard thing to do, but I do believe with practice or with a strategy, you can get better at it and minimize the number of times that you avoid being brave, right? That you're brave a little bit more than you were in the past. And, you know, one area I'll share with folks is this idea of practice. So get out of your head what it is you're thinking, get it on a sheet of paper. You know, we think in our heads, these ideas and our experiences, whatever, and got to get it out of your head and get it on paper. What am I experiencing? Why am I experiencing it? What are the different impacts of what it is that's happening? What are my recommendations on things that we can do, right? Just get it all out. And it can be a sloppy, messy piece of paper, but at least now it's there. And then you start organizing the thoughts so that, you know, this is how I would want to say it. What's going to be my lead in? What do I say? Keep it simple, of course. You, no one's going to listen for seven minutes. You know, once someone starts talking, their interest level potentially starts to dissipate if they're not engaged in what it is that you're saying. So you want to be short and brief to it, but you want to practice it. And the second step, of course, is finding somebody that you can practice with, where you can say, hey, I need to have a conversation with Tim. There's a behavior that we have all experienced. And I think if I were him, I'd want to hear it. So I'm going to be brave and he might not like hearing it, but I think it'll be good for him to hear it. Can I share with you what it is that I want to say and how I want to say it? Please be honest. Is there a word I'm using, an emotion, a body gesture, whatever that is not helping me? Because I want to make sure when I go in, I'm not thinking about what am I going to say because I've practiced it, right? So I know what I want to say and I say it. This is fascinating. You're advocating practicing a brave conversation. Now, obviously, that has to be done with a trusted advisor, someone that can help you. That's probably not something that most people do or even have ever done. I'm going to practice. I'm going to write it all out. I'm literally going to practice having a brave conversation with someone else. And we're going to go through this. We're going to role play this, right? We're going to rehearse this. What have you learned from doing that and from coaching others to do that? Well, what they learn are a number of things. One, they learn how to do it better. So who wouldn't want to do something that helps them do what they're going to do better? And of course, practice is something that we all do all the time, whether we know it or not. So, you know, I think I dress fairly well today. I'm sure when I was in high school, you know, I didn't dress as well, but over time I've learned what goes better together and how I should present myself. Of course, sports athletes and musicians practice constantly. You know, Tiger Woods did not wake up at the age of four and hit a golf ball 300 yards right? It took them practice and hours and hours and hours. You know, oftentimes we see celebrities, sports athletes and musicians at the peak of their career, right? They're at Gillette Stadium and they're at the peak of their performance. Well, they just didn't get that way overnight, right? It took years and years of practice. So getting better at what you do can be important. There may be words or phraseologies that are hot buttons, so, hey, you, you said that word. I don't know that's the right word to use. Maybe there's a different word you could use, but just hearing that set me off a little bit. And that's incredibly valuable, Tim, because you're practicing, right? You don't want to go in and have a conversation with the CEO of your organization about how people are feeling, not having practiced at all what it is that you're going to say, because you have no idea how it's going to be well received. So bravery is not easy. And having these types of conversations are not easy. And one of the ways to get better at them and feel more comfortable in the conversation is to ensure it's not the first time you're having it. So, Ed, you're turning on the light for me here in a way that I think is important for a lot of people. Good way, I hope. You're debunking a myth. And the myth that you're debunking is that this is the way that we talk about people. We say he, she, that person is a brave person, Right. That person is a brave person. That person is a timid person. Th that person is not a, not a brave person. We assign bravery as a label, as an attribute. But what you're saying is, eh, let's think more about it as a skill. It's not a fixed trait. It's a developable, a, a developable skill. And therefore, 
you should practice it and you'll get better at it. And as you get better at it, the confidence comes to use that skill. Do you find that happens with your clients? It does. And, you know, I also guarantee you that the people that we assign the word bravery to, if asked about it, would high, there's a high degree of likelihood they would say, oh, no, I, I don't see myself that way. Or, oh, no, I'm not brave, right? This is just how I think or how I feel or how I operate. And, you know, I've done this this way for a long time, right? So they themselves don't see themselves as brave. They don't say, yes, thank you. I am the bravest person I've ever met. To them, it is a way of behaving and it is a skill set, Tim. It is a ability to share information with another person that may be hard for them to hear, but is presented under the umbrella of helpfulness. If you knew I was going to come talk to you about something you didn't want to hear, but you knew I was coming to help you, the likelihood of us having a better conversation is significantly better than someone who feels judged, belittled, diminished by the nature of the conversation. So I do believe it is a skill set that with practice, and there's aspects of the practice you work on, it's not just practicing it, but there's some subsets, you will continue to get better and better. It doesn't make you a master at bravery because situations can vary, right? There might be a situation you don't know how to handle or haven't had to deal with in the past. But if you think about practice, getting the ideas out of your head, getting it on a sheet of paper, organizing the data and fine tuning it, your likelihood for doing it is significantly greater. And for most people, when we talk about bravery, they probably think, oh, well, we're talking about people that are not as brave as they need to be. And they, they need to learn how to be more brave. And that's going to enhance their experience. It's going to make things better. But what about the opposite category where we have people that are, they're very brave. They don't avoid confrontation. They may be aggressive. Bravery is not a problem for them. Jumping into anything, getting into somebody's grill is not a problem. They don't know how to do it. So they're brave in a destructive way. They need to pull it back. They need to be respectful when they're brave. They don't know how to be brave. They are, they make a mess of things. They leave awake. What about those people? Well, a couple of thoughts. One, I think I've chosen in my career to help you become braver than you already are. I don't want you to emulate or imitate others, but what about you? Where are you personally on the spectrum of bravery? And that's why motivation is important because you may not be motivated to be braver. You might be very happy being who you are and that's totally cool. I'm not judging that, but you know, I'm looking to connect with people who are attempting to be braver. And like any strength, as you know, in the work that you do, any strength can get overused. And so the sun is great, but too much sun is sun cancer. and Sugar is great, but too much sugar is diabetes, right? So anything overused can have the opposite effect of the direction that you're going in. So the volume of the work I'm doing, the nature of the conversations I'm having are around, you know, how can I help you as an individual, not as a, you know, icon of over <laughs> to being too brave, but how can I help you as an individual move a little bit closer to being more brave so that you're, uh, thoughts of regretfulness on past behaviors get diminished. I'm not eliminating them. I'm not being so bold to say, I've got a model that's going to eliminate regret and you're going to be brave every moment you can be, but you know, I can help you minimize it so that you're braver than you were yesterday. Yeah. Well, and I appreciate your emphasis because in most organizations, we need to learn how to do conflict better than we do. In fact, as I like to say, the creative abrasion is raw material to make good decisions, to solve hard problems, to make breakthroughs, to create new solutions. There's no doubt. So we need that. We need that constructive dissent. We need that high tolerance for candor. We need all of those things going on. But we, and I love the fact that you say this, you, you can't ever abandon respectfulness or that's what people remember. And, and, and then you become the object of attention rather than the issue that you're trying to raise. So I love that. I love that. Well, I was just going to mention, and again, I won't say it correctly, but one of my favorite quotes is the Maya Angelou quote about people won't remember what you said, people won't remember what you did, but they will remember how you made them feel. 
And it's so important in a conversation that you have with a colleague that they know 100% the only reason you're in this room is because you want to help them. You're not there to criticize them. You're not there to judge them. You're not there to belittle them. You're not there to debate it or argue it. You want to share with them observations that others are having and ensure that they're aware of it. Now, of course, the ball is in that person's court to do something about it. And I'm sure there are bosses out there who you're like, I've told my boss this for years and I've not done anything and say, okay, well, you've done everything you can do. You can't change the behaviors of others. You can only share the information and hope that they realize it at some point. And at some point, maybe the straw will break the camel's back and they'll realize it. But, you know, it's really how you make somebody feel in these conversations that will really maximize the likelihood for success. And I can't thank you enough for this rich, uh, very helpful conversation. Do you have any parting words for our listeners as we wrap it up? Well, I think when I go back to my most recent book, Drive Your Career, you know, there is a question included in the first chapter, which ties a little bit to bravery, which is the importance of having a positive relationship with your boss. And I would encourage all of our listeners to take time once or twice a year, not often, but once or twice a year to ask your boss the question, what's one or two things I could do differently to be more effective? It's just one or two things. It's not 20 or 30. It's differently, not better or worse. You want to use the word difference because that's a little bit neutral versus better or worse feels a little judgy. And who wouldn't want information on how to be more effective? So find time to ask your boss, what's one or two things I could do differently to be more effective once or twice a year. And I guarantee you the relationship that you have with your boss will improve. That's great practical advice, especially if you do it, as you say, consistently. You do need to do it consistently. Don't just do it once. Yeah. Ed, thank you so much for being on the podcast. What a rich, wonderful conversation. And thanks for the important work that you're doing. Thank you for advancing our understanding of bravery not solely as an attribute, but as a developable skill. Really appreciate that. Tim, I've enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for joining me today on the Culture by Design podcast. Be sure to subscribe and listen to new episodes every week. And if you'd like to see more of the work we're doing, go to leaderfactor.com.